Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrew Fide. I'm a professor of history at, at Shawnee State University here in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us for this uh, presentation as part of uh, Black History Month uh, here in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is uh, share my uh, screen here in just a minute, but um, <clears throat> I just want folks to know that um, there is a Q&A time uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you could, if you have questions, you're, feel free to put them in the chat. That way I can read them for everybody else uh, to, to hear them um, when there's, since we're recording this for future reference. Um, so if you could, you can put your questions there. Um, we also can, you know, uh, you can unmute yourself and so forth uh, for the Q&A as well. Um, but uh, again, welcome. Um, so let me let me share my my screen for my presentation. Here we go. And one more step there. Let's see. All right. Hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint now. Um, so the title of my presentation is Recovering the History of Portsmouth, Ohio's 14th Street Community Center. Um, and uh, I got a, a bunch of thank yous and acknowledgements and so forth, so forth I wanna get through uh, first. Um, let's see, it's not advancing, there we go. Um, First, let me just uh, uh, acknowledge uh, the, the support and funders that we have for um, tonight's program um, and the larger initiatives that this is a part of. Um, first off, uh, Ohio Humanities. Um, uh, this program is being funded in part through a grant uh, from the Ohio Humanities Council. Um, also, um, we've received funding from the Shawnee State University Development Foundation. Um, and the work uh, that, that we're doing here at Shawnee State uh, through the Center for Public History is supported uh, through an AmeriCorps program uh, uh, called Ohio History Service Corps. So the Ohio History Service Corps is run by the Ohio History Connection and Shawnee State and the Center for Public History is a host site uh, for an AmeriCorps member, a local history member. And all this is uh, supported through Serve Ohio. So I wanna uh, thank them for supporting um, this program uh, and the initiatives of, of the Center for Public History. Um, I do wanna give some special thanks uh, out as well for this program tonight. I wanna thank Maxine Malone, uh, the director of the 14th Street Community Center uh, so you see the FSCC, that's what that stands for, the 14th Street Community Center. Um, also, uh, big thanks to Drew Carter, uh, the board president, um, and Dr. John Valentine, a board member um, on, uh, of the 14th Street Community Center. Uh, these folks have been uh, instrumental in, in, in helping with uh, this initiative that we're working on uh, here um, as well as just in general supporting uh, Black History Month programming in Portsmouth and at the 14th Street Community Center. Um, at Shawnee State, I wanna thank uh, the support of uh, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Jennifer Pauley, uh, as well as the Vice President uh, and Provost, uh, Dr. Sunil Ahuja, uh, and Chris Moore, uh, the Director of the Shawnee State Development Foundation. These folks are also key behind the scenes, uh, providing support for uh, these efforts. And uh, Amanda Wachowiak um, has also uh, been a great support uh, through the Ohio History Service Corps uh, as that local history member. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna uh, thank Dr. Cassie Patterson, um, who's the director of the Southern Ohio Folk Life uh, a nonprofit that we're partnering with um, in, in what we're calling the North End History Initiative. Um, so all of this um, material that we're working on that we'll be discussing tonight is, as you'll see, is part of um, a project hosted by the Center for Public History called Scioto Historical. 
and we're working on uh, version 4.0 right now. So we'll have new tours and uh, content updates, um, new research discoveries or recoveries, however you like to think of it, um, new video, audio content, uh, just in general, we're, we're working on a, a refresh and design, um, and then a, a promotional campaign to launch uh, the new content uh, this coming fall. And so part of, part of this new content and one of the new tours is gonna be a tour of the civil rights movement history here in Portsmouth, Ohio. Um, so to support the development of the content, um, but also to support the preservation of uh, the history of the 14th Street Community Center and, and other uh, uh, institutions in the Portsmouth community and the North End community, um, we're also uh, endeavoring sort of like a collection of, of um, historical records and oral history interviews and so forth. And uh, so we're going to be conducting oral history interviews uh, about the history of the 14th Street Community Center, as well as other um, history uh, related uh, events and locations uh, to the civil rights movement. Um, so we've currently got scheduled uh, two days coming up here uh, in March uh, on, on Saturday the 5th and 12th. Uh, we're calling them history harvest days, but uh, we're scheduling interviews um, and also time if you have historical photographs or other sorts of documents that you might want to um, have digitized and put into a community uh, digital archive that will be hosted uh, at Shawnee State uh, on our digital commons, um, which is uh, again hosted by the Clark Memorial Library uh, here at Shawnee State. Um, so, you know, if you are, uh, if you are interested, um, we are scheduling appointments now and so forth. And if you have questions and so forth, you feel free to contact me uh, if you know Cassie uh, or Drew or Maxine. Um, but uh, you can email me uh, to get involved, to get more info, to help preserve history. And there's my email, afight at shawnee.edu. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do tonight is... Uh, is talk about the history of the 14th Street Community Center, its origins um, uh, in the early uh, 20th century and a, a really vibrant uh, black civic movement um, that you saw here in Portsmouth, but also uh, regionally, you could say, uh, in the cities of uh, Appalachia, as well as nationally. Um, and out of that, uh, or part of that was definitely the civil rights movement. Um, but uh, the story of the 14th Street Community Center will be included in this new virtual historical tour uh, that explores the history of the civil rights movement here. So this is a uh, screen capture of the uh, map interface of the site historical app. Um, this is this version of it with the tour and all this is currently not publicly available because it is under development, but um, what you can see here is sort of the map interface, um, which allows you to, to zoom in and out and, and spin the map in different directions. Um, and this is zoomed in so you can see that there's, I think we have six or seven um, stories here. Um, but each of these uh, red pins, uh, you can consider it to be like a virtual historical marker. Um, and as you stitch the different historical markers together, that's how you end up with a, a tour. Um, I'm referring to it as a virtual tour because um, uh, while I guess you could theoretically walk it or drive it, um, uh, it would take probably a few hours or more. Um, anyways, it would be fairly extensive. And so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, conceiving of it at more as a virtual tour uh, that you can take um, but also you can pull up uh, on your phone uh, when you're at a location or near one of these locations and so forth, or you can use the app to get directions to the next location uh, in the tour. Um, so we've kind of zoomed in here and um, are looking at uh, what's referred to as the North End neighborhood of Portsmouth. It's the historic African-American neighborhood. Um, 
uh, pretty much bounded by, uh, you might say, 11th Street um, in the south uh, up to uh, 16th Street um, uh, to the north. Uh, that, that's the direction we're looking. Um, and then sort of bounded on the west by uh, Chill Chillicothe Street or Gay Street. Um, and then on, on the east, um, sort of by uh, Offner Street, you might say. Um, but uh, uh, like many cities in the United States, uh, Portsmouth was redlined in the 1930s. Um, and, uh, you know, this, the residential segregation uh, was reinforced as a result of, of the redlining. Um, and that's very much a part of, of the city's uh, history. Um, so with this project, one of the things that we you know, have to do is uh, figure out where to drop the pin or to attach the, the, the uh, historical marker. And so um, one way to think of this project is uh, like a version of geolocated storytelling. So, um, uh, you know, in the case of the 14th Street Community Center, it's pretty easy, uh, easy for us to figure out where to drop the pin. Um, where the center is located. So then again, just sort of zooming in here, um, you can see where the, the center is located. Um, and this would be the map interface. Okay. All right, so um, I wanna place, place the history of the, the center in sort of a larger context of a black civic movement uh, in the 1920s. Um, so it does have, uh, the center has its origins um, in, in this movement uh, that is very much shaped by the era of Jim Crow when, when Portsmouth, Ohio, like uh, much of the United States uh, was segregated along racial lines. Um, this civic movement that I'm describing was national in scope, like I mentioned also regional in that sense, finding it in, in, in other areas of Appalachia. Um, <clears throat> and um, it included a focus on things like education, uh, public health and wellness, recreation, um, uh, you know, so basically focused on civic betterment, but also it involved advocacy organizations that championed uh, social justice and equal rights. Um, and so like in Portsmouth, you see uh, the establishment of a branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, um, in the uh, early 1920s. Um, the, the, that early history of the NAACP here locally is, is still uh, sort of shrouded in some mystery. Um, there's not uh, a lot of newspaper uh, coverage um, uh, of the branch and its activities early on. Um, but it does pop up here and there in the Portsmouth uh, uh, Daily Times. Um, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to ultimately track down um, some additional records, um, perhaps through the uh, national organization. Um, but uh, the, the, the early history of the NAACP here in Portsmouth, I'd say, has, has yet to truly be written. Um, but it was very much a part of this sort of broader um, uh, uh, you know, civics mo civic movement. Um, and the civil rights movement, if you want to, you know, sort of branch that out into its own uh, separate movement, um, this movement that ended uh, Jim Crow in the 1950s and 60s uh, really has its roots in this earlier uh, civic movement. Um, I mean, certainly you can trace it all the way back to uh, the abolitionist movement and the in the early um, 19th century. Um, but just, just as, uh, you know, in the days of, of MLK, uh, uh, the movement, this, this earlier movement I'm talking about was nurtured uh, and supported um, by the black churches of the community. Um, they often provided the much needed meeting spaces, um, also leadership, um, both from the ministers, uh, but also from many of the elders uh, in, the, in the local church organizations. Um, in Portsmouth, you see this movement leading to the creation of uh, what was called the Portsmouth Interracial Commission um, in 1929. 
Uh, this is the earliest reference that that I've been able to find for for the commission. Um, it appears that it went through a couple different sort of iterations. Um, it may have initially been set up with the backing of the Chamber of Commerce, um, uh, and it sought to the commission uh, sought to improve race relations in Portsmouth, um, but also to try to improve. Um, communication and ensure that the interests of the Black community were, were better uh, represented or supported um, both by the Chamber of <laughs> and, and local government. Um, so that, that early commission that was set up in 1929 would be reorganized in 1931. Um, and it was reorganized with the leadership and under the presidency of Dr. W.H. Lowry. Um, doc, Dr. Lowry was a dentist um, who moved here to Portsmouth uh, in about 1923, 1924. Um, but under his uh, leadership, the uh, Interracial Commission would support the creation of a community center uh, in the city's North End neighborhood. This photograph of, of Dr. Lowry, I, I would say, I'll just point out, um, is from a Des Moines, Iowa newspaper um, and it dates to uh, about 1917-1918. And just a little quick note here on Dr. Lowry. Um, I, I did give a, a presentation earlier this month um, that was sponsored by Shawnee State, uh, Office of Diversity, <clears throat> Equity, and Inclusion, where I looked at the life of Dr. Lowry um, and Dr. James Forrest Scott and their contribution to um, to both the civil rights movement locally, but, but also efforts at um, uh, black wellness um, uh, and health. Um, so Dr. Lowry moved to Portsmouth about 1924, um, and he would quickly emerge as a, a leader in the community, local black community. Um, and, and really, I think a lot of the energy of, of, uh, of the civic movement um, uh, has a lot to do with Dr. Lowry's uh, leadership. Um, but he had studied dentistry at Iowa State, um, had a practice in Des Moines, uh, where he married Henrietta uh, Mason. Um, in Des Moines, he served as the vice president of, the, um, of their branch of the NAACP. Um, and so uh, what little records we have here in Portsmouth, it does appear that he was also active uh, in the Portsmouth branch after moving here. Um, it will be interesting to find out if he was one of the players in ultimately bringing the NAACP uh, to Portsmouth. Um, let's see, in 1926, uh, he helped establish the uh, Portsmouth Council of Race Advisors. Um, this was uh, sort of morphed into uh, what became known as the Portsmouth Welfare League uh, in 1928. And as I was saying, he, he reestablished the Interracial Commission in uh, 1931. And in that reorganization in 1931, that's when Dr. James F. Scott, um, a Black uh, family practitioner, um, uh, was, was uh, a member of, of that commission. And it becomes clear, I think, that, that Dr. Lowry served as a mentor um, to the younger uh, Dr. Scott. So the, uh, the origins of the, of the 14th Street Community Center um, really comes, comes out of this uh, uh, movement where you see different organizations being created. And some of these are sort of you, you can describe and historians describe them as sort of parallel institutions that were created as a result of Jim Crow, as a result of segregation. Um, so uh, the plans for this initial, uh, quote, Negro Center, as it was uh, called, as you can see in this headline from the Portsmouth Times in 1931, um, the plans were, were championed by a newly organized um, luncheon club for Portsmouth uh, businessmen, for Black Portsmouth businessmen. Um, it was known as the Peerless Luncheon Club. Sometimes you'll see it referred to as the North End Luncheon Club. Um, but uh, ultimately it becomes known as the Peerless uh, Luncheon Club. And the first president uh, of the club was a man named William E. Haley. Uh, and William E. Haley was also on that, 
that reorganized interracial commission um, with Dr. Lowry and Dr. Scott. Um, so think of the, the, the Peerless Luncheon Club as sort of uh, the ana analogous to, um, uh, to, to white only civic organizations from this time period um, like Kiwanis or Rotary um, that would have you know, like a, a monthly um, uh, lunch meeting um, uh, you know, where civic projects and things like this were supported uh, and funds raised and so forth to put towards such projects. Um, so the initial project that the Peerless Luncheon Club adopted in, in some ways was, you know, was their primary um, uh, project, excuse me, um, was a community center. And um, it was, uh, according to this, these early records, uh, the community center was meant to serve the needs of of the city's young people, the North Ends communities, young people, giving them a place for recreation under stimulating and inspirational surroundings. So um, a little bit on, on uh, William Haley, um, right? So he was a member of the Interracial Commission. Um, he was president of the Peerless Launching Club. Um, his uh, career, his profession, he was a barber very successful barber in Portsmouth. Uh, just to give an example, in 1927, his shop was located in what was called the Playhouse. The Playhouse um, was um, <clears throat> kind of like a, they had a lunch counter. You also could get beer there, but they had billiard tables in the basement. They had a, um, uh, a bowling alley. Um, reportedly upstairs, they may have had some gambling uh, and poker tables, perhaps, um, but it was sort of a, a, a gentleman's sort of a hangout. Um, they would also uh, have the scores, the latest scores coming over the radio or wire from sports, and so numbers, the numbers game, you know, numbers were sort of run out of the, were run out of the, uh, the, 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 the playhouse as well. Um, but the playhouse on Chillicothe Street still stands, so that barber shop was located in a building still standing. It's, it's just north of the um, Masonic Temple building on Chillicothe Street. That's the old K&M restaurant, some people might recall. Um, but that is where, at least in 1927, we know that, that uh, William Haley's Barbershop was located. Um, that's also where, by the way, the owner um, uh, was uh, William Gableman. Um, and Gableman was very active in the, the NFL Spartans uh, uh, football organization. And so that's also where um, you, know, you would have been, they would have been selling tickets uh, to NFL Spartan games uh, at that same location. Um, so uh, William Haley was the son of Reverend Addison Haley, a founding member of uh, Portsmouth's Pleasant Green Baptist Church. Um, and he went on to become the uh, pastor uh, of Pleasant Green as well. So he was raised, uh, uh, William Haley was raised in the, the, the Pleasant Green Baptist Church um, with a father who was uh, actively engaged in the community as a civic leader and as a religious leader. Uh, Haley was involved in Republican Party politics, and I think that helps explain how he was appointed state inspector of barbershops for Ohio, um, but this put him on the road into different cities across Ohio, put him into connection with a lot of different um, uh, branches of different organizations and so forth. Um, and really, I think helps explain uh, his influence and power, you might say, um, within the state as well as locally. Um, uh, he was the editor of a of a uh, newspaper here in Portsmouth called The Pilot. Uh, the Colored News was another, uh, like the other title for this paper. Um, it's not clear how long it published um, and whether or not any copies have survived. We do know it existed. Um, there are references to it in the Daily Times, um, but it may be like, like so much of uh, Portsmouth's okay. black history um, it may be lost, lost to uh, time and lost to the flood, really. I'm, my suspicion is that 
1937 flood, which uh, inundated um, all of the North End, um, uh, requiring the evacuation of everybody uh, in the neighborhood. Um, that that copies of of the uh, the pilot or the colored news may have been lost with the flood. But I I would I would be so thrilled, um, and it would be an amazing discovery um, if if there are any copies that survived um, and ultimately could be you know, opened up, you know, for historical study. Um, but what this tells us here, you know, is that in the 1920s, you know, Portsmouth's um, black community, you know, centered in the North End uh, was very vibrant, um, had many organizations that were active in trying to uh, imp improve the community um, and to ultimately push for uh, equality uh, and contribute to the civil rights movement. Um, so Mr. Haley would go on to become the uh, first president of the board of the 14th Street Community Center. Um, and he was the husband of Jean White Haley, who was the first director of the 14th Street Community Center. Um, and hopefully you can see an amazing improvement there in that photograph, uh, that portrait of Mr. Haley. Um, what we were looking at before, and I'll, I'll see if I can go back. Um, this is a, a microfilm, um, a microfilm version of the newspaper um, that up until now was all that could be uh, accessed. Um, but uh, thanks to a project at Shawnee State and the Center for Public History, um, we've been able to recover, in this sense, um, the you know original hard copy uh, photograph that was reproduced in the Daily Times. Um, and this is an example of the work that we're doing at Shawnee State. Um, and I'll just say a little bit about that before we, we go go forward so that you can get a sense of the scale of, of, of the work that we're doing at Shawnee, um, but also the potential um, for recovering um, the photographic and historic record, uh, not only of Portsmouth, Southern Ohio, and the, this region of Appalachia um, in general, but more in particular, Black history. Um, uh, uh, the photographic re record uh, really um, uh, needs this type of recovery. So um, what we're looking at here um, in this photograph uh, is the historic Portsmouth newspaper collection, which was donated to uh, Shawnee State by Civitas Media, which is the owners of the Portsmouth Daily Times. Um, about five years ago, um, the papers, uh, the paper, the owners of the paper, uh, I'll phrase it that way, um, concentrated or moved the printing of the Portsmouth Daily Times to Gallipolis uh, to a location of one of their other presses. Um, so they no longer needed the building um, and that housed this uh, huge printing press. Um, and they downsized their offices to, to uh, a, an office like in a strip mall uh, here in Portsmouth. So they no longer needed um, all that space. But one of the things that was in the old building was um, a rather large collection of Portsmouth published newspapers, not just the Daily Times, um, but other titles going back to the 1820s. Um, so in total, there's some 18 different titles um, going from the 1820s through the 1980s. And our goal uh, is to um, digitize these, uh, make them keyword searchable, um, and make them available to the public so that they're not behind some kind of paywall, um, you know, where people can't access them. Um, and it's going to be a multi-year uh, project. Um, but we're hoping to pilot our first uh, title, the Daily Evening Tribune, one of the earliest uh, daily papers in Portsmouth from the 1850s um, as our pilot project. So this is the uh, original hard copy of the article about William Haley, um, where we were able to um, uh, you know, really recover this great 
portrait of him um, where you can actually see what he looked like. And there's again the example just showing you just how how important it is for us to be able to digitize the original uh, newspapers. So um, back back to uh, our story though at hand here about the community center. So the interracial commission uh, officially endorsed the club's plans in October of 1931. Um, on the 1st of January, 1932, um, we had the opening of the community center, which was originally located on 11th Street at a 1011 11th Street. So this was in a rented building uh, on the same block uh, as the Booker T. Washington School. And so it was conveniently located uh, to serve the neighborhood, the neighborhood's youth. The Times did report on the opening um, and the plans for the opening, um, but uh, you'll see here that a program will be presented at three o'clock and the rooms will be open for inspection until 10 p.m. A community orchestra will furnish music for the occasion and the glory bound quartet will sing. Mrs. Roberta Pemberton and Mrs. C. Lintheum will give readings Everyone is invited to inspect the rooms and enjoy the program of games and music. The hostesses will be the wives of the members of the Negro Luncheon Club. Lunch will be served by Mrs. B. Bassett. There will be no admission and guests may come and go at any time during the hours named. William Haley is president and Oscar Pfeiffer, secretary of the club. And so, uh, here's the reporting on the actual opening. Um, you know, center opens 150 present. Colored citizens provide recreational club for young and old. Um, it says the community center is to be run on the order of the YMCA uh, and is for both young people and adults. The hall will be open every day from 3 until 10 p.m. It will be a recreational center and members may enroll at any time. So the first uh, sort of public programming that they had was what they called a book shower, um, where they asked people to, uh, to, uh, to bring a book uh, or a magazine, uh, which could be donated uh, to the center's new library, um, which would be of interest to young persons or their elders. So the the original uh, center thus was uh, established by the uh, Peerless Luncheon Club. Um, it was established on 11th Street um, uh, and it served the community for a number of years before it was um, expanded um, with uh, the construction of a new building, um, which would be uh, owned by the, the center itself. Um, and so this expansion and the new building um, ultimately was uh, the result, uh, you could say, of the Great Depression um, and the New Deal, uh, which was put in place by Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, to try to tackle the problems uh, of the Great Depression. Um, so <clears throat> I would add to that that um, racial segregation in Portsmouth um, and related discriminatory policies and federal jobs programs also would contribute uh, to the funding um, and support and the construction uh, of this original 14th Street Community Center building. Uh, interest in the construction of a new and larger community center building um, gained support, you could say it emerged and, and generated support after the Civilian Conservation Corps, this uh, New Deal program and jobs program uh, established uh, seven uh, camps on the outskirts of the city in the Shawnee State Forest. Four of those seven camps were home to segregated uh, black companies of enrollees, each with 200 men. Um, and just a quick sort of uh, side note here about the CCC and segregation. Um, 
the CCC was run by the U.S. Army Reserve, uh, and as such, it was set up uh, under military discipline. Um, the U.S. military at this time, the U.S. Army, was racially segregated, um, and so uh, partly because of the segregation of the U.S. military, you see the segregation uh, of the three C's. Um, but the legislation that created the Civilian Conservation Corps did stipulate um, that um, African Americans were not to be you know, discriminated against. And so what that was interpreted by the uh, administration um, was that you would take the percentage of the African American population overall in the United States, um, and then you would sort of establish that quota that that would be the percentage of, of African-American um, openings uh, within the uh, CCC. Um, so this, this uh, ensured that there would be um, African-American uh, positions open in the CCC. Um, but we also know um, that there were higher rates of unemployment for African-Americans during the Great Depression. And so there was actually a greater need for um, uh, these programs than, than the sort of 10% uh, uh, number that was used. Um, so there, in other words, there still was discrimination, um, even though the law stipulated that there was not to be. The whole segregation of the troops and all that was also roughly, you know, based upon current U.S. Uh, Supreme Court uh, interpretations uh, that we know as separate but equal. Um, so the, the, the context for the creation uh, of, of uh, the, the community center um, is within Jim Crow and, and racial segregation and, and the uh, support for the construction of a new center um, derives some support as well from the result from the fact that uh, you had segregation, you had um, a large number of African Americans that were um, stationed in camps uh, outside of Portsmouth, um, who of course came into the city uh, when they uh, had leave and so forth. And, and so there was a need to provide um, uh, recreational facilities and so forth to, to the 3C. So you can see um, here from a newspaper article in the Times from January 1934, um, you know, with, with limited recreational opportunities uh, in Portsmouth, um, both white and black civic organizations in Portsmouth came together to promote uh, the construction of a new center in the North End. I'd also note that um, there was the creation of, a, of another recreational center for the 3C in Portsmouth um, in another building in, 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 in downtown Portsmouth, which um, was for the white CCC enrollees. Um, so again, this, this segregation, the separate facilities and parallel institutions and things like this. Um, so the, the 3Cs, as well as another uh, jobs program would be key uh, to the construction of this of the community center, and that would be the National Youth Administration. Um, so both of these New Deal programs were important to the origins of the 14th Street Community Center. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with the Cito Historical Project and the work we've already done, uh, some I'd, I'd point you to our work um, on this Civilian Conservation Corps in the Shawnee State. Uh, park and forest. Um, uh, the work that we've done there um, actually did help lead to the construction of this stone memorial. Um, the uh, bridge in the park was uh, uh, was replaced. It was a historic bridge built by an all black, all World War I veterans company of CCC enrollees, company 1545. Um, but um, anyways, the state uh, and the county engineer um, uh, had federal funds and so forth to uh, replace this bridge. Um, and as mitigation for the loss of the bridge, um, you had the construction of, of this memorial. 
Um, so you can check this out in uh, Scioto Historical. Uh, you can download the app or go to the website, but uh, you can see where the um, memorial, uh, Stone oh. Memorial is located there at Roosevelt Lake uh, in the Shawnee State Park out on Route 125. It's about a 15 minute, maybe 20 minute drive uh, from downtown Portsmouth. So um, the National uh, Youth Administration, um, really they're the ones who constructed the uh, original 14th Street Community Center. Uh, funding for the center um, uh, for the labor was secured through the National Youth Administration. Uh, the NYA, if you're not familiar with it, was originally part of the Works Progress Administration. So you may have heard of the WPA, um, but the NYA was, was focused on uh, uh, young uh, men and women ages 16 to 25. So boys and girls um, from families who were qualified for relief, um, they were paid 10 to $25 a month uh, for part-time work, um, which was really uh, meant to provide vocational training. Um, so over the course of the uh, history of the NYA, over 4.5 million American use uh, uh, did find work. Um, families received relief in that sense, um, but they also received important vocational training. Um, and here, I think it's important to note that um, uh, the NYA had a special division of Negro Affairs, and this was headed by Mary McLeod Bethune, uh, who was a prominent uh, African-American educator and civil rights leader um, I believe she was the first uh, African-American woman to be appointed the director of a federal um, division. Um, and um, uh, that was thanks uh, to President Roosevelt and I believe Eleanor uh, may have uh, uh, suggested it as well or supported it. Um, but thanks to Bethune's championing of uh, projects for African-American youth, the NYA uh, would help fund projects such as the construction of Portsmouth's original 14th Street Community Center. Uh, this is uh, some promotional materials from the NYA uh, Negro Division, um, uh, you know, promoting the work that they were doing. Some 78,000 uh, Negro youth are employed uh, by the NYA at this point in time. And you can see the various different types of jobs um, that the NYA provided. And here again, some coverage uh, in, the, in the Portsmouth Daily Times uh, regarding the NYA's involvement in this. So the, um, <clears throat> the Portsmouth Daily Times also endorsed uh, the project. Uh, in October of 1939, um, you know, they said, what, what to do with the youth of our colored community has been an acute problem for some years. They have no adequate and desirable meeting place, no park or space for supervised, rec supervised recreation, no youth program designed for our local conditions. That a community the size of a small village is confined within itself without proper facilities for the social developments of its youth is certain to cause citywide complications. Um, you know, it's like without stating the obvious, you know, like why is this? Uh, obviously, it's because of uh, Jim Crow segregation, discrimination, um, the, the white only uh, operation of area recreational facilities such as the Terrace Club, what would be known ultimately as Dreamland. Let's see. So um, the Daily Times did note the historic uh, nature of, of the project here in Portsmouth. They said the center will be the first built by the NYA in the state for colored youth. It will be one of the few existing in the country. So ultimately to get it constructed, um, the city of Portsmouth uh, would purchase uh, the land for the center. 
Um, this was done uh, thanks to the backing of city manager Frank Sheehan, uh, as well as Councilman Frank Rowe and George Kerner. Um, you did had, have uh, the, the city council support the project. Um, uh, in addition to purchasing the property for $800, um, they also uh, floated $6,000 worth of bonds, uh, which paid for materials. So the NYA uh, provided the labor and, and uh, supervision. Um, the city uh, provided uh, the land um, and the materials. Um, and then uh, you had a, a major groundbreaking uh, uh, ceremony um, on the 2nd of November, 1939. Um, uh, this is uh, the microfilm version of, of the article. And uh, we've not yet tracked down the original hard copy, but we're really hoping that that these images um, will be recovered and will show a lot more detail um, that has been lost in the microfilming process. Um, but it does uh, note that the Booker T. Washington School Band led a march of students to the location and a chorus of choirs from churches in the North End added to the musical program. So the center uh, will provide a place of organization for recreation, cultural and educational activities of Negro youth of the city, who at the time, uh, note here, numbered some 600. Uh, it will be of brick construction, 52 feet by 71 feet, and we'll have separate reading, craft, and recreation rooms for boys and girls in a central lounge. There will be a kitchen, an office, a storeroom, and restrooms included in the one floor plan. Let me just note here is that um, Maxime Malone, when I gave this talk uh, at the center this past Saturday, uh, Maxine noted that the uh, old center did have a basement. So um, it seems that the uh, plans did change from uh, at the groundbreaking ceremony to when it was actually completed. Um, so the paper noted the supervision of the center will be accomplished through an organized committee it will be equipped to accommodate all community activities, providing recreation for the 200 enrollees at Camp, I'm sorry, at CCC Camp Shawnee as well. So that reference was to um, Camp Shawnee number two, uh, which was uh, one of the first African American uh, camps at Shawnee uh, in the 1930s. So um, construction on the center um, was delayed largely because of U.S. entrance into World War II, um, but ultimately you do see um, that uh, progress um, would, would be made, uh, and ultimately um, by the end of 1942, um, the center is just about ready for its opening. Um, and the opening of the center was on the 1st of uh, January 1943. So after nearly four years of construction, um, it was opened to the community. And Jean White Haley, the wife of William Haley, uh, served as its first director uh, and executive secretary. And William E. Haley uh, was elected to serve as the board's first president. And again, another example uh, of um, uh, a microfilm version of a photograph uh, here of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Haley. Um, and thankfully, this too, we were able to uh, uh, recover and restore. I just love how she's uh, reading a, an issue of Ebony Magazine. So, um, I want to wrap this up with just some a few more examples uh, uh, that we've found so far um, uh, in, in the newspapers um, of the 14th Street Community Center and its uh, photographic record. Um, this is not from the papers, but I do want to mention this, um, that we're currently looking for photographs of the original 14th Street Community Center. Um, the Ackerman collection at the Southern Ohio Museum does have this photograph. 
Um, it's a photograph of the men of the Trinity Lodge, number nine, Prince Hall, free and accepted Masons. And they're standing uh, at the uh, entrance of the original NYA built uh, 14th Street Community Center. And this dates to 1964. Um, uh, just a little side note on, on the, the lodge. Uh, they were first chartered in 1872. Um, and I think that uh, it's important to, to see the lodge um, and, the, and the Black Masons as another one of these civic organizations that were really essential um, and critical to the uh, emergence of these other organizations um, and in supporting the uh, community center itself. And uh, I want to uh, thank Gary Hairston for um, helping uh, identify um, and, and, and speak with people in the community to identify the, the gentleman in this photograph. Um, the photographic record um, of Portsmouth, particularly of the, uh, in the archives, you might say, the current archives in Portsmouth, um, uh, the archives, you, I guess the best way to say it, are pretty white. Um, and this is a reflection um, of the segregated uh, history of the community. Um, and also, to some degree, I think uh, the loss uh, of uh, historical records and, and things like this in the 1937 flood um, that particularly affected the, uh, the North End neighborhood. Um, but um, one of the things that we're trying to do at Shawnee State uh, and in the at the Center for Public History is to is to diversify the archive to um, um, to try to include the inclusivity and and so forth to preserve um, this history and make it available to the public. Um, so uh, we see these recovering of the photographs from from the Portsmouth Daily Times as really a critical. Uh, way to diversify this archive and to recover uh, Black history in Portsmouth um, that uh, uh, for a long time was neglected um, and uh, has not has not been uh, preserved um, or included in, in local archives. Um, so uh, this is one reason why I'm, I'm particularly excited about the, uh, the work of the digitization project um, as well as the community archive project that we're uh, launching at Shawnee State. So um, just a few more images uh, here that I wanted to share uh, that we have uh, recovered of late. So um, we were looking for photographs of, uh, of Jean Haley. Um, and uh, this is one of the, another one that we found, again, the microfilm uh, compared to the um, original hard copy. You can see this is a, a newspaper report um, about the fraternal order of police um, giving uh, the center um, uh, a new uh, ping pong table um, with paddles and so forth. And you have uh, Ms. Uh, Jean Haley there, director of the center, trying out one of the paddles as she admires the handsome table presented on behalf of the FOP by a committee including left to right, Patrolman Marion Neal, Patrolman Alvin Perry, and Detective Ronald Parker. Um, here in another um, uh, article, uh, photo essay, you could, you could say, um, this one uh, involves uh, four different photographs, um, two of them dealing with a play, that uh, a dramatic production that is being put on uh, at the 14th Street Community Center, and then the other involving a sewing class um, being conducted at the center. Um, but here, zoomed in and with the caption, James Brown, seated, who will play grandpa, uh, works a crossword puzzle with the help of Donald Ellis, the butler, and Lois Taylor, a student. The caption here, Carolyn Carr, seated, uh, playing grandma, tries to settle a dispute between Joyce Fisher Wright and Helen Haley. And the caption here, Mrs. Walter Ferguson inspects some hand stitching on a dress 
Mrs. Arthur Pass is completing for herself, while Myrna Ferguson left and her sister Marcia model two dresses made in the sewing class. And then uh, lastly, uh, the caption reads, Miss Roland Tanner watches as Mrs. J.W. White performs a sewing job on the new electric sewing machine installed at the center. Okay, so um, that would complete my presentation. So thank you. Um, and one last thing, again, I wanna invite your participation. Um, we are scheduling appointments. Um, uh, for the history harvest that we have scheduled on the 5th and the 12th. Um, so if you know somebody that uh, you think should be interviewed or you'd like to be interviewed or you'd like to interview somebody, you can help us out by also uh, joining us in the sense of interviewing people as well as being interviewed. But anyways, if you're interested, um, we'd love for you to, uh, to help us out and join join in the project. You can email me at afight at shawnee.edu and check out the project at sciotahistorical.org. Okay. All right. So um, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to field any questions. Um, you're welcome to uh, put them in the chat or we can un you can unmute and uh, um, you're welcome to uh, ask questions that way. Where, where did you get most of your um, most of your information from? It was through the the uh, the online portion where you uh, researched the the articles and stuff. Yeah. So. Um, this history really has not been written up. So there's not, there's not like a book or an article I can, you know, I could, I could point to. So, um, it's really, uh, largely based upon the newspaper records. Um, currently there are some daily times that have been microfilmed, uh, and that microfilm has been digitized. Um, there's two, uh, you know, uh, two websites that that have this one's called newspaperarchive.com and the other one's newspapers.com they basically have the same uh, newspapers that have been digitized um, and um, that that is where I did a lot of my research and um, and they not only have the Portsmouth papers uh, like the Portsmouth Times but they have papers from uh, Des Moines Iowa so like that material on Dr. Lowry um, I was able to find that material by searching um, in the Iowa Bystander newspaper, which was was actually a black newspaper uh, published in Des Moines. Um, there's another paper in Ohio that I that I would point you to, um, and that is the Call and Post out of Cleveland. It was a black newspaper in this time period um, that had had basically a, a statewide circulation. And uh, Jean, Jean Haley, by the way, she actually had a, a, a regular column in the column post. And I think it was called the Portsmouth News or something like that. But it was, it was kind of like a, a social column, uh, you know, about the latest goings on in, in, in uh, Portsmouth and nor the North End, uh, who, who was in town, who, was, who just got a scholarship to go to Wilberforce, you know, th this type of info. Um, and uh, the Daily Times did also have a North End column for a while as well. Um, and so, you know, there is that's where some of this information would, could, would pop up. But um, really, a lot of the historical record, I think, has yet to be digitized. Um, the newspapers in Portsmouth, for example, you really had two newspapers competing at the same time. The Daily Times was the Democratic paper in this time period, and the Republican paper was called the Blade um, or the Tribune. Um, so the Tribune became the Blade, and and um, uh, but um, uh, so you would have really there, there's there's like in other words like a whole nother newspaper archive, you know, a whole nother uh, 
viewpoint with different perspectives um, coming from the Republican side. So uh, when ultimately this is digitized, I think we're going to find all kinds of new historical uh, materials. Um, and, and really the, the Daily Times that we have uh, is the full, you know, uh, run and the current microfilm and digi digitized copies of the microfilm is incomplete. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's so, I did a little research in um, uh, census records, um, uh, city directories uh, to get locations and, and, and things like that um, to confirm like where Dr. Lowry's and, uh, address was, for example. Um, and, and that city directory is in the Portsmouth Public Library in the local history department there. Um, so you can go to the Portsmouth Public uh, Library local history department. And they have, they have, um, they have some of the, they have Portsmouth Daily Times on microfilm and they also have some blade uh, newspapers on microfilm. But none of that has ever, none of the blade has ever been digitized. It's inaccessible. And that's one of the things that we hope to remedy with our project. Wow, that'll be awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be great. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be awesome. Let's see, um, I'm checking over here in the chat if there are any questions. Um, yeah, um, I guess going back to Gerald, you, when I was doing my presentation, you, you asked about a, a white center uh, at, in Portsmouth for like the PCC. Um, and, and it appears that because uh, you already had the 11th Street Center, um, that there was, you know, they did, the CCC men did go to the 11th Street Center um, before the 14th Street Center was built. Um, but there was a separate hall um, in, a, in another building, maybe on Chillicothe Street. Uh, it's, I, do, I do need to do more research on that, but there, there appears to have been like another recreational center that was set up for the 3C, but it, it looks like it was for, for the white CCC. Hey, Drew. Hey. Just playing here. How you doing? Great. Good to see you. Thanks for Stay joining here. us. My pleasure. I, I really fascinating um, information. Had no idea about it. Do you, I don't know if you had any, um, if you looked into, was there any cross fertilization or to what extent was there cross fertilization between Huntington's Black middle class and Portsmouth's Black middle class? And, and, and not only the middle, but the institution the institutions and the fraternities and right. you know, those kinds of things. Yeah, um, when I, let me, let me, let me uh, plug your book, uh, Black <laughs> Huntington. Um, when, I, when I read your book and saw that, I, you know, I was like, oh, wow, this is, <laughs> this is, this is awesome. Um, because there are connections between Portsmouth and Huntington's Black community. Um, and, and uh, some of those connections became clear to me by, by reading your book, I guess. But um, the, the, the primary connection rises through the railroads, um, yeah. the, the employment opportunities um, and, and, and those sort of connections. But, but you're right that there were, I think, like the Black Elks here in town. There, there, was, yeah. um, there was another, there were two, I think there were two other uh, sort of black fraternal organizations um, uh, in addition to in, in addition to the black elks and the, and the uh, the prince hall masons um the, i know that there's a connection in the 1950s with the civil okay. rights movement um there was a guy named i want to say russ mcconnell huh? who grew up here in portsmouth was like a like a, a football star at the high school, which was integrated. Um, and he, his, his, his father was active uh, in, in some of these organizations that I mentioned before, but, but Ross McConnell um, lived in Huntington for a while um, and, and then moved back to Portsmouth. 
Mm-hmm. And when he came back to Portsmouth, like in 19, it was in early, early fifties. Um, he, he helped form a, a group called the civic forum. Okay. And, and, and they were, they were the primary legal sort of entity that sued the Portsmouth city schools, uh, about 1952 over segregation. Okay. And, and so there's definitely, and I, I've been wondering like, what is McConnell's, what was his connection in Huntington? So I, I mean, I know sure. it's there. I know it's there. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting that it's called the civic, what was it called again? Civic watch? The civic forum. Okay. Cause you know about the civic interest progressives in Huntington? Recognize the name. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, that was the civil rights, interracial civil rights organization okay. uh, in the sixties. Uh, okay. comprised of Marshall University students and, and community members. So it's interesting that they both have civic in it. I, I, right. you know, it's, we can't tell if there's any real direct link there, but that is an interesting coincidence. Well, I, it's, it's an area of my research that I haven't you know, really dug, dug too much on that connection, but um, I, I think it would be fruitful. Uh, yes. You know, for sure. Yeah. Well. You know, maybe <laughs> down the road a little bit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyway, appreciate you. Yeah. Well, thank I'll you. Let other folks chime in. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, happy to answer any other questions. Yeah, go ahead, Lisa. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, redlining briefly earlier, and I wondered if you had, had seen any redlining maps of Portsmouth or... Uh, um, yes, there is a redlining map of Portsmouth. Um, um, I, I, I can, I'd be happy to share it with you. I have copies of it. It's, on, it's, there's a, there's a website where you can actually access almost all those maps. Um, they've been digitized and, um, the, um, uh, the map for Portsmouth is, is, uh, is interesting. I mean, if you never really looked, looked at those maps before, you'll, one of the things you'll see about Portsmouth is that there there are a number of areas that were redlined, um, and uh, you know so it it's not simply that that's where the black neighborhoods were. It was it was where the the poor, um, like the the poorest neighborhoods were. Um, but by it, the way it was implemented, it you know ended up creating a racial racial segregation. It reinforced the racial segregation of Portsmouth. Um, but the area of like where the Portsmouth, I'm sorry, where Shawnee State is located, um, in some ways the construction of Massey Hall, from my understanding, was a an urban improvement uh, project. Um, but there were neighborhoods right <clears throat> behind Massey Hall to the flood towards the river on Mill Street um, that, uh, you know, were, were, were particularly poor and dilapidated, um, damaged by the 1937 flood um, and, 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 and so forth. So but anyways, my, my point is when you look at the map, you'll, you'll see that the north end clearly sticks out as like an area that's red. Um, um, but there are other areas in Portsmouth that were also redlined. Okay. Yeah, we have a, an exhibit. I think it's some kind of a traveling exhibit up in the library where I work right now about redlining. And uh, uh, there was a book discussion a couple of weeks ago, The Color of Law by Richard yeah. Rothstein. Right. I just read it. It was really good. Mm -hmm. All about that and all kinds of other things I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're planning to... to sort of delve into that history of residential segregation um, with the story of Farley Square, the, the oh, yeah. um, public housing project um, that was built after the 37 flood. Um, because you also had the construction of Wayne Hills. Um, um, I, I was about to say at the same time, but actually Wayne Hills was, was started just before Farley Square was, okay. and um, it actually was 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 the source of a lot of controversy because uh, the the black community was like, well, you know, what what about what about us? Because you know, yeah. you know, the North End had been so damaged by the flood, um, 
and um, and ultimately, you know, they, you, you did have uh, the city put in and, and successfully secure funding for Farley Square, but um, you know, both those those maps, the the redlining maps, um, and and the segregation of public housing in Portsmouth just re reinforce the you know the segregate segregation of Portsmouth resident residential um, life. Um, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any any other any other questions? Well, um, I, I uh, want to thank everybody again for for being here. Um, and, you know, you guys are awesome <laughs> uh, for appreciating this history. Um, so uh, thank you, and um, I, you know, I look forward to uh, to additional conversations with with each and every one of you. So uh, uh, here's to uh, hopefully a, a great year. Uh, where we make great strides uh, in advancing uh, local history, um, but also um, Black history here in Portsmouth. So thanks, folks. Thank Hope everybody you. has a good evening. Thank you.